It's no secret that writing can be lonely work, but does it really have to be? Whether you're full-time, part-time, or just starting out, you'll get insights into the tricks, tips, and production habits of writers from every level of the biz. From best-selling authors to those launching their first novels, you're sure to be in the company of friends as we encourage great writers to divulge and share their secrets. This is The Great Writer Share Podcast with your host, best-selling author, Daniel Wilcox. Hello and welcome to the Great Writer Share podcast with me, Daniel Wilcox, where every week I natter with some of the friendliest and most hardworking writers around today, forcing them to divulge their secrets, share their wisdom and bear their souls, all for the sake of helping you, the listener, advance your writing career. Hello and today's date is the 23rd of October. We are steaming towards Halloween, uh, one of my favourite times of year. I, uh, I've had a very, very good week in that I have had the proof through for my brand new novella, which is very exciting for me. It's always nice to have that moment where you're holding your work in your hand and seeing the finished product. And I'll be interested to see how the sales go for that this Friday, considering this will be my first solo work in a good, I think since my first book, actually, um, about four years ago. So a big moment for me. Should be lots of fun. Um, today's guest on the podcast, we are talking to Rachel Heron, who is a... Oh, what isn't she? She is a, a romance writer. She is a thriller writer, nonfiction, memoir, uh, blogger, Patreon, extravaganza, lovely lady. And we had a fantastic chat. Um, actually recorded this episode last week, but I'm still reeling and inspired by some of the things that I spoke to Rachel about. And just a conversation we had. It's always fun to run podcasts like this where you have guests on and you sort of seem to click. You think a lot of things similarly. And uh, I always thought from listening to Rachel's podcast with Jay Thorne, who was a previous guest, the writer as well, that she was a lovely person and that has been confirmed now that I've spoken to her in person, both on and off the podcast. So Rachel, if you listen to this, this one was bonus. Thank you very much. Um, but we do talk a lot about various different things that I've been wanting to speak to someone about at least um, over, the, over this course of this episode we go deep into patreon and how rachel has managed to create a ecosystem on patreon which is paying a monthly paying the bills and has reached an audience level that is just incredibly impressive particularly for patreon i think she has 300 followers um and we go into how she uses that to motivate her to keep her going to hold her accountable very very dig deep into that i think there's a lot of lessons to take away we go into blogging and personal branding and Rachel has been around in the blogging scene for a fair number of years and has a lot of authority on that scene to to say some of the stuff that she has said. So um, as someone who is looking at incorporating blogging into some of his work going forward, it was really, really interesting to talk about that and how to manage your personal brand and build that into your work so that you can basically be a, be a success by being you without having to pretend one way to run under pen names under the other and just to be you and have that as a marketable product to sell and uh be true to what you do and we do also go a lot into uh towards the end of the interview into welfare and mental health rachel is a big proponent of looking after yourself of appreciating the moment of finding ways to just experience the world and we go a lot into that which was very very interesting so uh, lots of good stuff coming up but before we get there i'm going to give a shout out to the patreon page over at www patreon.com forward slash great writers share where for as little as one dollar a month you can get a load of extra bonus content and stuff for this podcast you can show your support for as little as one dollar a month and get things uh, get entered into things like the monthly giveaway you can get early access to every episode you can speak to all of our friends over on our slack group and join the community there of budding authors all working hard and helping each other out and uh yeah there's just lots going on so um this show will always be free, but if you do want to get a little bit of extra bang for your buck, then just head on over to patreon.com forward slash great writers share. Um, but without any further ado, I am going to jump straight into this very, very impressively wide ranging interview with the one and the only Rachel Heron. Rachel Heron is the internationally best-selling author of more than two dozen books, including Thriller under R. H. Heron, mainstream fiction, feminist romance, memoir, and non-fiction about writing. She's a fellow podcaster and is the host of the How Do You Write podcast, as well as a co-host of the Writers as Well podcast with previous guests of the show, Jay Thorne. Rachel also runs annual writers' retreats and delivers incredible essays on the creative life to her patrons on Patreon. So, Rachel Heron, welcome to the show. Daniel, are you a patron? I am not one of your patrons, I'm afraid. 
How but, do you know that they're excellent? I was so, I'm so impressed because they are. I must because say. my so my theory for this is you have so many followers, <laughs> there has to be something quality within that work to constitute that many people on there. And I love that. since we since we're already on that, and that was a point I was going to hit, let's jump straight into Patreon and just go for it. So you've got you've got well over 300 people on Patreon. Can yeah. you explain a little bit to my listeners what it is you're doing over at Patreon? And what kind of value are you bringing to people and how are you kind of working that? Because Patreon is, it's a difficult nut to crack from what I've seen a lot of people yes. do. It is. And I love it so much. And I love talking about it. Um, so my Patreon was the one thing that allowed me to leave my job three and a half years ago. I was making just almost enough to jump ship and become a full-time writer, but not quite. And then Patreon start. I mean, I was, I was in kind of in the beginning with Patreon, but um I finally figured out what to offer my people. And creative nonfiction has always been my, my favorite thing to write. I love memoir. I teach memoir. I write memoir. And, but I wasn't writing it. I was writing novels under contract and for self-publishing, I'm, I'm hybrid. Um, but I wasn't writing the creative nonfiction that I loved. So I realized that if I set myself the task of writing an essay a month, to be within some kind of topic. I generally, I generally do a year's worth of topics. Um, there was this one year where I wanted to replenish myself. So every month I tried a different challenge and trying to fill up the creative well, uh, that kind of thing. And I set it on a per thing basis, which was kind of regrettable, uh, <laughs> because I, I used to not produce an essay every month. I do it every three or four months until, you know, smart friends reached out and said, you are leaving our money on the table. We want <laughs> to give you $5 to write an essay or whatever it is. Uh, you can get the essays for $1. And I realized, oh, I have to do this every month. Mm-hmm. And now I'm, I'm, it fluctuates but, uh, when, I'm, when I either have um, new coaching clients or not, but it's usually around $2,000 a month that I'm getting from this. It's so needed and necessary and it, and it allows me to do this. It's one of those things, you know, like I'm always worried it's going to go belly up and suddenly Mm -hmm. I will not have that coming in. (laughs) Well, the, the biggest benefit of it has been that it makes me write books. It makes me write collections of essays every month because I've left it on the per thing. I, I must produce something. Left produce it on something. That. I've left it on that. So on the last day okay. of the month, I'm usually finishing up the essay <laughs> I've been writing for the last three days and I'm trying to get it in because if I do not produce it, then I'm, I'm taking $2,000 out of my pocket basically. So it makes me do it and it's genius because I work best under a deadline. And so that's really clever in a way to motivate yourself while also trying to stick with that, what is essentially would be the monthly model. Exactly. And the nice thing about... Um, about that in particular is that we are paying ourselves advances for the books we want to write. So when I get done, I give the book, actually my agent has two of those books right now that she's going to try to take out. But if they don't sell, I don't care. I've already made, you know, $24,000 advance on each one and whatever I self publish and make more money on will just be extra. Um, The problem with Patreon and that I always like to bring up is that it is not a discoverability model. Mm. Kickstarter, people actually swim around on Kickstarter and look for things to back. They look for things to give a dollar here, $10 there, whatever. Um, Patreon, you have to bring people to. I already had a listenership and and I I guess I had a readership um, because I started blogging in 2002 and I had a pretty large readership on that. And then that is what helped me get my agent and sell books. So those people who had been with me for a really long time followed me over to Patreon. that's that's the difficult part of Patreon is getting people to buy into what you have and to see that it's it's worth something. So how quick of a transition was it from opening up your Patreon account and sort of starting the essays to actually being able to, like you say, support yourself with that with that money each month? Yeah, good question. I set it up then. I'm not even sure if you can still set it up that way, but it was a per thing basis and I wasn't going to do anything until I was making $500 a month. Because if I spend you know, I usually spend three or four days worth of work on a Patreon essay because they're usually about 5,000 words and they really mean a lot to me. So I don't screw around with them. I want them to be really, really good. Um, So I set myself 500. I'm not even going to try doing this until (laughs) I reach 500. And it reached 500 like the second day that I'd put it out there. So I was like, okay, I've got to write it. But then it it was a real long, slow build after that in a lot of $1 contributions. Mm -hmm. Um, 
I generally have seven or eight people who are in there at the coaching level, which is a hundred dollars a month where we, you know, hang out and I read their work and we talk once a month. Uh, but most, most people are at the one to $3 level, which is exactly the way you want it with Patreon. Mm-hmm. Because as people's incomes fluctuate, if you lose a hundred dollar patron, that hurts. If you lose a few fives and a bunch of ones, and then you get more ones and a couple of fives, then it, it evens out. Are, do you have Patreon? So I've got one for this show, which is yeah. growing slowly, which is quite nicely. Um, yeah. Shout out if anyone wants to join the show and, and jump on board, then feel free. There'll be links in the show notes. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, no, I've got one for this. And then uh, my other podcast, The Other Stories, has a patron where we sort of do bonus stories behind the scenes that people can join in. And nice. it's, it is a slow burn. And we found that unless you are constantly reminding people that it's there, people are quite slow to the uptake. And the the value of what you're offering behind the scenes has to be enough to constitute that, that donation. And obviously for, for yeah. us, we think sort of $1 out of someone's pocket is, is nothing. It's just, it's just a kind little tip for us, but to someone else, it is a big thing to think, okay, I'm going to support that person and show them how much by actually giving them financial rewards. So yeah, I've, I've dabbled in it a bit. Um, but I'm, I'm actually looking myself in the next year or so of putting more of myself out there under a patron. People um, love that. Yeah. Because you've, love that. so from, like you said, you've got sort of clients that you've been getting from different rewards here. You've got loads of different things that you offer. How, how much of a, I'm trying to think of the right word. How much does it actually help facilitate the growth of your relationship with your, with your readers and your fan base? Because you must see people starting at the $1, then getting up to five, then 10, then 25 and seeing that they, slow progression of them coming. They do. Towards- and that boggles my mind. And I don't know why they, I don't, I honestly don't know why they do that. And sometimes it just feels like a tip, like job well done, Rachel. But, <laughs> and then other times when I see them go from 10 to $1 or whatever, I, it never bothers me because, you know, I'd, I'd rather have them there with me at any level. Um, but yeah, I think it's just gradually getting more. I want to put out to, in your mind, um, the idea of the pledge drive too. I did a Patreon pledge drive about about a year ago, so it's probably time to do it again. Just like public radio stations do here in the states, they'll have every six months a pledge drive where every hour or two you're interrupted to remind you that if you listen to the station, you could give a few bucks. And it's the most annoying thing ever. And people do it. I that's when I always pledge to my local public radio station because I don't think of it other times. So every year now, I try to think of something a little bit new, a little something that I can twist or tweak, and then re put out on all my Facebook pe- people and Twitter people and Instagram people, those Mm. kind of things. For me though, in terms of generating back and forth, um, I like to follow people on Patreon who are doing it really beautifully. I follow, uh, what's her name? She's married to Neil Gaiman. I know who you mean. Who's killing um, it. Yeah. Amanda Palmer is killing it. She makes, I think, I think she makes sixty or seventy thousand dollars every time she produces a thing, which she does at least two or three times a month. So, yeah, exactly. and I just it's insane. <laughs> but I give her a dollar or three or however many times she produces a month, just to watch what she does mm. and just to see what she's giving them. She really connects with her fans through Patreon. For me, I use it more as a delivery device of these essays, which I honestly don't think is is good enough. I'm not using it in the way it should be used because I have I have friends who were like, oh yeah, I'm supporting on Patreon. And I said, oh, what do you think of the essays? You write essays? Like they (laughs) they just want to support. They don't even really read the emails that are sent from them. Mm. So I don't know how to shake that up. And I'm always kind of working on trying to figure that out. So for you, is it more um, accountability to actually do the essays and get the yes? So that's kind of like your primary focus and everything else is an additional benefit reward. Yep. Yep. Okay. Fantastic. And you mentioned Kickstarter as well. Have you, have you had much experience using Kickstarter at all? I never have tried. No. no. Okay. Have you? No. Uh, so I haven't, no, tell a lie. I did. I uh, had a failed campaign last year. I was looking at launching a, yes, it was um, a, th- a six part audio drama series. And um, I think I slightly overreached on my target mm. because we, we made probably enough money to have probably funded it. But I think we kind of boosted it up a bit just to try and get a bit of extra money for sort of the talent that were that was getting involved. And yeah, it was failed, but it was a it was a learning experience. So um Can you bring down a level? Uh, can you bring down the amount you want? Not once it's live. Dang it. Yes. That would be great if you could. <laughs> exactly. Because if you then go through services, so places like Indiegogo, and I think maybe go get funding, do it where you can just no matter how much you make, that's how much you make. But Kickstarter is yeah. yeah, Kickstarter is just bats away your money if you if you don't hit the target so it's so stressful to even to look at it 
it, yeah, it was uh, it was unfortunate, but like I say, it was uh, an experience to learn from. But I've seen a lot of people, um, particularly sort of indie creators, use it as ways to drive up their their pledges and their funding for different projects. So um, I don't know it might be something that I play around in the future. But yeah, I think that crowdfunding is is I think it's just brilliant. I really, really do, especially something like the Patreon model. I just I love them. I feel <laughs> like it's very. Because I, I personally struggle with it a little bit because I, I like the idea of the rewards that you can get from it. And obviously, it's a good way to read out and give people a chance to to reward you and to sort of um, support you. But at the same time, there seems to be a vulnerability when you put yourself out there. You're, you're outright declaring, I'm worth this amount of whatever. It's so hard. Yeah, yeah. And you seem to be someone that's very, you seem to live very on the surface and you seem to be very... Um, just honest in your approach. Obviously, um, I listen to a lot of you and Jay on the right as well, and that's how I came across yourself. <laughs> Listening from the start, um, yay! Back in the pe- uh, pedal to the metal. Pedal to the metal. Yep. It's pretty difficult <laughs> to say when you when you're British. Um, <laughs> but I'd love I'd love for you to talk a little bit about um, what that show is, just for people that aren't aware, and also um, why you decided to do it in the first place, because it does particularly. Actually, I'll save that question. I'll let you sort okay. of do a little explanation, and I'll. So we started the podcast, Jay Thorne and I, it's called The Writer's Well. And um, we started it because he came on my show, How Do You Write? And he presented himself in an email that said, you know, I, you know, will you consider having me on your show? And in many cases, I say no to people because there, you know, I, I get a lot of things like that. And, and, and I hate to say this, but sometimes like the straight white male, I think, what is your hook that I need to hang you on? Cause otherwise you can go be on any show. <laughs> um, and I do like to lift up women and people of color and all of that. Um, but there's, I had heard his name just cause you know, he's Jay Thorne and he's mm-hmm. everywhere. So I thought, oh, whatever, I'll, you know, I'll talk to the guy. And as soon as we said one sentence to each other, we were just in love with each other's personalities. We got on like the proverbial house on fire, couldn't stop talking. And as we were hanging up after the show was recorded, I don't know which one of us said it, but it, one of us basically said, we probably shouldn't start a podcast together, should we? And the other <laughs> one said, no, definitely. Let's do that. Okay, we'll yeah. do that. So a week later, we had a podcast and I had gone uh, full-time writing maybe, I can't remember now, maybe six or eight months before we started the show. And I was still terrified, really, really terrified to be a full-time writer because uh, I'd left a six-figure job and I need this income to provide, you know, I, I, to provide our mortgage, I need to be working and make a fixed amount of money. And Jay was about six months. No, he was about a year away, I think from making the leap to full-time, but he knew when it was coming. So we started the show and it was talking about the process of moving from part-time writer to full-time writer. And then after he made the jump, we basically just decided to keep the show going and talk about living the writer's life healthily with, you know, with health in mind, um, all kinds of mental health, mental, spiritual, physical, all of it. And we just have remained the best of friends. And it's one of those beautiful relationships that I, I, I could do this job without Jay in my life, but I wouldn't want to. And so what we do on our show, which you know really well, is we don't have it. We don't have guests. We just surprise each other every other week with a question. Um, I give him one week, he gives me another week and we just answer the question. And because it's kind of that, you know, softball throw that we have to catch and talk about, we're really, really open and we're really, really honest. And there's really nothing we're ashamed to talk about. And we do talk about things that could be considered shameful a lot of the time, which I always think is really where the heart of all of us lives. And so when you tell me that you want to put yourself out there more for your patrons or for anyone else, that makes me really excited. That's what (laughs) we want to lean in and listen to. We want to hear you talk about that. Fantastic. Yeah. I mean, having listened to the show from the start, it's been kind of gratifying, I guess, to see the evolution of the show from what it started of. And at the beginning, I remember you guys saying, you literally just want to jump on a call, 20 minutes, no intro, no outro. It's just two yeah. guys talking about whatever yep. it is you want to talk about. And then to go from that, and obviously it's had its name change. Um, you've now yeah, got- because <laughs> we realized that the pedal to the metal, he, I was the pedal, he was the metal. It didn't mean anything to anybody but us. <laughs> but and you know that people somehow. We still found people yeah. somehow. I have no idea how. And then when we tried and changed it to the writers well, our listenership went up like 70% because of, <laughs> you know, we used a title that meant something. Yeah, and we're so dumb. We didn't think of that for <laughs> so long. But I love it. And then obviously there was a logo change, and I think 
having you guys be so open and honest about your journey as you go through, whether it's finances, mental health, um, your actual author journey has been, particularly for someone like myself, I went full time in April this year. So I've been. Congratulations. Yes. Um, Are you still so, terrified? You must be still terrified. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. mean, I don't think it ever goes away, but I'm kind of. It doesn't. <laughs> no, I'm uh, ba- overbalancing the terrified with just working my ass off. Yes, I'm still in that phase. Yeah, because mm-hmm. I started with the little bit of the, okay, I'm full time means I can relax a little bit because I have more time to play with. And then you suddenly go, nope, nope, nope. I need to, I need to swim harder. I need to be working 16 hours a day, yes. every day. Yeah. And I do. And <laughs> as a, as a point of proof, this is 8.30 or 8.45 for me in the evening. So, um, but any time to talk to you, Rachel, I'll just, it could have been three in the morning. I would have had you. <laughs> I would, no, we would not do that. No. <laughs> but, um, yeah. So the, the show itself following your guys' journey. And, um, I think it's just, it's one of those things where, a lot of podcasts that you listen to that are around writership tend to be about people talking about specific subjects and it'll always be the, the positive sides of stuff over the negatives. Really it's people that have succeeded at certain areas of writing. Whereas this, you, you do talk about your ups, you talk about your downs. Um, I remember there was obviously a period where um, you guys were sort of talking about certain losses in your life. You talk about your health things and one episode, I think it was last week's episode, the question that you asked Jay, I was the wondering. Entire episode, it was. <laughs> it so was. For you listeners, the question was, "Is it worth it?" How do you know? How do? You, how, what do you answer that question with? Is it worth it? And there was. A, <laughs> we really. Um, it, we didn't bring each other down, but there was a point at which we both quit writing on the show. <laughs> no, we're done. You're right. It's over. Yeah. Um, but it was a very real, honest conversation, and I have to say that our our comments blew up. We were getting emails from mutual friends saying, oh my God, are you guys okay? Do you need (laughs) help? How can we assist you? But it wasn't, we weren't looking for that. We're just really honest in that um, it is, this remains the best. There's no better job in the entire world unless it is like raising baby lemurs from hand and even (laughs) that is probably kind of stinky Mm -hmm. this is not stinky this is the best job in the world and there are still it's still a job there are still days when you're demoralized and you feel like the biggest (laughs) failure and you're never going to crawl out of it and it's it's kind of analogous to the way we look at our work right like Mm -hmm. i will write a scene and it's the best thing that's ever been written and the next scene is the worst thing that's ever been written and the truth is in there somewhere it was neither the best nor will it ever be the worst. The truth is just everything is kind of okay. Mm. And, you know, what we write is what we write. This life is what we have. This, this now, this chair that I'm in right now talking to you, that's the important part. This is, this is the journey. Yeah. So, yeah, I was wondering if you heard that episode. Yeah, no, definitely. Maybe people shouldn't start with that one. <laughs> Maybe don't start with that one. But I think the part, um, the part that got me from, from both of you guys was the fact that you, you both were quite, outright and saying you could earn more money doing something for half the effort elsewhere. Oh yeah. But there's, there's obviously some kind of calling or some kind of internal motivate or some drive that is, is keeping you guys at the keyboard, keeping you writing and doing everything that you're doing, working all these extra hours in the day. I know there's something that does that for me. I can't explain it. I'm definitely working more hours than I did during my day job because there's no off switch. There isn't my email. If I look at my email, I'm working. If I look at my email at midnight, that is just work. That's not seeing if I've got a brunch date. That's just all the work that's waiting for me when I sit back down. Mm. Yeah. So what does keep driving you? What does keep bringing you to the the keyboard and, and bringing all these stories and these essays and everything? What is it that drives Rachel Heron? I, I love that you asked that. And I, I only think I'm able to answer that in the last year or so um, that I've kind of starting to figure out out, but it's, it's obvious I should have figured it out 20 years ago, <laughs> but it is, um, it's connection. It's just mm. connection what it, it may be just an age thing as I get older, but it really does come down to, you know, our two primary responses are love and fear. And they're kind of two sides of the same coin. And the love part is triggered and fed by connection in any possible way. Like the connection that you and I are having right now, mm-hmm. the connection that people who are in their cars listening to our voices, they're taking the time to put our voices into their ears as they drive the car. That's a connection. The connection that my fiction readers have with me or with the narrator that I choose to create and put on the page. The connection that I have with people who read my nonfiction um, and who feel like I'm a friend to them. And they always say like apologetically, I feel like we're friends, but you don't know me at all. And as soon as they say that, I feel like they are my friend, you know, and tell me about yourself and I want to get to know you. And the fact that writing has this 
this direct line to the brain. Um, that famous Stephen King quote from On Writing, where he talks about writing is actually telepathy. Mm-hmm. You write down something, and 20 years later, somebody else reads it, and that image that you put on the page transmits itself to another person's brain. That is a sublime connection that I don't even think we get you know, in TV. We have it in reading, and we get to do that as writers, and that is what keeps me coming back. And, and also an egotistical sense of like, but, but this happened to me and I want to tell you about it. <laughs> Luckily, I also want to hear what other people have to say. So it's not narcissistic. But, <laughs> but, as, but as writers, I think we all do have this particular kind of ego that drives us to keep going and we, we need it in a little way mm. or in a lot of way. What do you think about that? Yeah, no, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think um, a lot of what I'm searching for is immortality but not in that narcissistic way in that trying to transcend my own life in order to number one prove to my son that this is a real career and you can actually make a living (laughs) doing the things that you love um and then uh, yeah and then beyond that just sort of years down the line it could be a case of if he has kids and he has kids there's that constant reminder that that is something that is possible particularly with the digital world how it is and everything else um that possibility is just endless so that's kind of my truth but i completely agree there's there's so much in the way of connection how many times or how many different channels you can actually reach out to people and hear back from them so i think that would have been something that it would have been missing probably 30 40 years ago was now we have social media um and you seem to be very active and very good Mm -hmm. with engaging with your readers in a variety of different ways and that instantaneous that quick connection is something that is invaluable particularly to them let alone us as authors And if you go back, like I say, 30, 40 years ago, that would have been letter exchanges. It would have been difficult to send stuff back, more work. And it's just, it's something quite rewarding living in this bubble of, of people you can kind of touch and reach out to. Even, even closer than that, 17 years ago, when I started the blog in 2002, most people didn't know what blogs were yet. I didn't, I barely knew what a web blog was. I thought it was a stupid idea. My sister told me about it and I immediately had to have one. And I remember (laughs) pushing play on that first post thinking, what cheek of me to put a post into the world that says something, who's going to want to listen to that? And before that, the the average person didn't have a way to reach a large amount of people unless it was a, you know, letter to the editor or speaking Mm -hmm. on your radio station or writing books. And, um, and now we have this and everybody, you know, and then Facebook took over blogs because then everybody got to do that. And I, I, I hate Facebook, but I love, (laughs) I just can't stand it, but I love the the up of, this ability to communicate. I just don't mm. want to communicate with everybody on Facebook. <laughs> so. Yeah. And since you brought up your blog and one of the questions that I wanted to get to was you seem to have a knack or of, of I'm trying to think of the best way to say this. You seem to have done really well in, in making the things that you love your brand and making an entire living around the stuff that you like coming back to you being sort of very honest and very truthful about who you are. I mean, you've got things like your memoirs, you've got your fiction, you've got knitting, you kind of bring up a lot. Um, and started as a knit blog. There you go. And you seem to have been just very, very good at, at nurturing the things that you love and turning that into what is you and what people now know is you and making that into without being so crass, a, a product that you can kind of sell and get to people. How, how difficult was that journey to kind of be honest and vulnerable with those things from the start? Was it easier because you started with all that straight away and just went into it? (sighs) Another good question. I I was kind of chuckling because (laughs) I'm only good at that because I'm bad at branding myself any other way. I'm just bad, bad at narrowing my focus my focus has always been so broad and just like any other writer, I'm fascinated by every single thing that I see. I just, you know, a shiny thing on the street. I want to know who made it and why is it there? And if I meet another person, I want to know their whole backstory and why are they on this bus with me? And, um, and that shows in my blog. In fact, it was a knitting blog, but there were people who were reading my blog and they didn't know it because I never wrote about knitting. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, um, and for a while I called it my glass house. I remember because I just figured I didn't want to throw any stones and I wanted to live this transparent life that other people could look in and see. Um, because there is, there are a lot of privacy concerns and there were then, and there still are, but I just want, I guess just always connect. I just always wanted to connect. So it has hurt me in ways like I just don't have a really branded brand. Uh, but 
it has helped me in that I think I draw in different kinds of readers for different areas. I have the knitters, I have the the sewers, I have the people who read romance, I have the people who read thriller, I have the sober people, I have um, oh gosh, different uh, different community, so many different communities that I like talking to and talking with, and they all kind of come to this one place, and it's still always just me, and you know, in stories when we tell stories. What, no matter what genre we're, t- we're in, we still have the same message. We always bring the same message because our voice and our tone and our core story is always going to be the same. My core story is always, no matter how dark it is, there is hope, even if, it, if it's hard to find. And that's what people come to me for. Even I wrote a, I wrote a, one of my books was basically about a character who's dying through the whole book and then we know she dies. There's no way out of this. And people were like, oh, it's so comforting. What a beautiful book. I'm like, I wasn't supposed to be comforting, but I guess that's what I do. So um, yeah, I guess my answer is that it was not a cohesive process. It was not even a coherent process of doing this. It's just been about me trying to be as myself as I can. And that, But that did take years to learn because I think I did... I did hide behind walls for a long time, different walls that I would put up and then tear down. And I'm sure that I'm behind some now and I won't know what they are until I need to tear them down later. Mm. What's your view on blogs in 2019? Because I know that there's, it had its big surge in the early 2000s. It grew, it grew and grew. I am unfamiliar. I don't follow too many blogs myself, but with, is blogging in 2019 something you'd recommend to people who are new to the space? How's it kind of looking as far as you're aware? I love blogging still, and I'm trying to actually double down on my blog right now and bring it back to life because I, I just kind of let it go. It was a placeholder for a couple of years, but I realized that, you know, we were, <laughs> I was at the vet the other day and, and I told the vet, you know, I think my cat's about seven. And then I looked it up on the blog and, it, and the cats are 12 because I blogged about when I brought oh, the wow. kittens home. I, it was a big difference and that did make a <laughs> difference in their care. And I like using it for that, for actual milestones uh, that I can, I can look up. I also believe that in terms of moving into a world where there's so much content, there's just this fire hose of content that people fall in love with us and our writing because they resonate with our voice and they may resonate with mine or they may not, but if they fall in love with my voice, they want more of it. And if I can use my blog as content marketing to pull readers into me with a SEO, any kind of Google search, if I get them and hold them, then there's a chance I get to keep them. And if I'm writing about all the things that are on my heart and they like what I write, I mean, I've done that. I've, I've Googled something, ended up on a blog, read a beautiful piece and thought, who is this person? And then, oh, they wrote a book. Oh, that's an interesting, I will buy that book. And it, it really works. And I think it will continue working. That said, if blogging is not something that you love to do, I never suggest that somebody does it in order to gain visibility or to for content marketing it is something that you do if you're passionate about it if you like putting yourself out there uh, so do you have a blog i've toyed with them over the years i've yeah. not given one a go for a while but i'm looking at integrating one onto my website at the minute um but i think my the the sticky situation that i think a lot of people fall over to start with is is knowing what the right approach is and i know that there'll be an element of finding your voice the more you blog Absolutely. and finding your routine but then it's having the confidence just to stick with it is, is a difficult part. It's, and I don't even, I do not have a good answer for that. I get <laughs> super excited about my blog about every four months and then mm. when I do three posts and then, Oh crap, it's been another month and I haven't posted. Yeah. No, it's definitely <laughs> on my agenda. I'll, uh, I'll let you know how it goes when I do get to it. But Please do. Yeah. 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 Something that I did want to hit um, as well, because time is, time always goes fast in these interviews um, to the point where I'm tempted to try and increase them in length. But at the same time, I think an hour is a nice, a nice round time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But one thing I did definitely want to hit was uh, obviously you've recently jumped over into the thriller genre with Mm -hmm. um, stolen things by RH, RH Heron. Um, I have never heard a British person say it, and I just want to hear that all day, all day long. R H Heron. R H Heron. We say the, we say the boring R H Heron. R H. And R H. And that sounds like a, it sounds like, a noise you'd make if you didn't feel well but our our h i think it might be slightly emphasized because my uh four-year-old is currently learning phonics so (laughs) everything's h h but um so there might be an element of that where i'm trying to (laughs) over over qualify for him um r h heron but uh yeah talk to us about that transition because obviously before that you were working in romance 
you're doing your memoirs, you're doing sort of the sweetest stuff. Now you've gone into a bit more of a, the gritty thriller genre. So what was that hop for you and, and what brought you in that direction? It was kind of a weird transition. Um, I went from romance and then to darker mainstream fiction um, about like family dramas and stuff. And that was a more natural evolution to the thriller. But even so, uh, basically the three mainstream books that were from Penguin, they all, they all flopped. I'm a good, I'm a good flopper. I am internationally <laughs> bestselling, just not in America, other countries. <laughs> Really, uh, the only thing that's ever been a bestseller in the states are my my nonfiction. Uh, but so so those had flopped. But I'd had this thriller in mind about a nine one one dispatcher because I was a nine one one dispatcher for seventeen years, and I wanted the book to open with her answering the phone, and it's her sixteen year old daughter on the other end of the line. And what does the dispatcher do then? And what happens? And why is she calling? And and so that unraveled. But because it was a new genre my agent and I decided that I would write it on spec and make it as good as I possibly could. So that was like six or seven revisions with her before we took it out. And the name, it also went to, to Penguin, but a different imprint um, to Dutton at Penguin. And the name change was because it's more gender neutral and basically men might buy it if it's a, if it's initials, whereas men stay away from, um, some thrillers that look kind of like the domestic co- mm. uh, cozy thriller. I guess there's no cozy thriller, domestic thriller. Uh, but that, you know, but that's it's clearly branded, you know, very pink. It's, a, it's definitely a women's domestic thriller, uh, which is interesting because now I've heard that some men are right. This was just something I heard in the industry recently that some men are writing with initials trying to look like women writers because women domestic thrillers have been doing so well. And I've seen that. I've seen a couple on the shelves and I just kind of think it's really interesting how publishing is always trying to catch up with what they think readers want. Mm. And I think they're, you know, sometimes right and sometimes wrong, but, yeah. uh, but also it was a good break for my name because they didn't really want it to be confused with Rachel Heron. Mm. I was able to keep it an open secret. So all my social media is branded RH Heron slash Rachel Heron. But for them, it, I was, it was me starting over. Yeah. And how did you find that, that journey into starting over again? Cause it's, it's a new genre for you. It's, it's putting your name under a pen name. It's, it's all of that. So what was that like for you? Because when was, when was your first book picked up for traditional publishing route? 2008, it was sold. It came out in 2010. That was the first of a three book deal. Um, and then so it's been probably... about 10 years since you've had that sort of into a new genre feeling. Yes, and by right. the looks of it, it years. seems to be pretty successful so far. I mean, it's it's done it's done as as it's it's done better than any of my other books and my publishers I believe are pleased but I think no one's doing cartwheels which is that's my that's what I would I would like somebody to do cartwheels someday <laughs> <laughs> but but I'm pleased with this it. It my first hardcover so there was um, there was excitement and dread over that because it's a hardcover yay and it, you know who is going to pay twenty seven dollars for a hardcover book that you don't want to hold in bed so I don't know. Uh, but what was, what was the question? What was the process like? Oh, the funniest thing has been people, because they brand you a debut novelist, which really makes me feel like a big fat liar, but that's a publishing, that's my publisher's decision. Debut novelist, they say R.H. Heron is a pseudonym for an author who lives in the Bay Area. It's not even a pseudonym. My initials are R <laughs> and H. So Isn't I consider no my name. I'm not, exactly. But then the funniest thing is the, 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 <laughs> the reviews that come in and say, this just does not read like a debut novelist. How accomplished <laughs> she is for such, a, for such a new writer. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> Wait till they find out. <laughs> then that's the marketing side of it, isn't it? I guess. I mean, I, I've, I've full on always been indie, and I think I, I would love someday to go down the traditional route and potentially have a book picked up. I think everyone's got that tiny part of them that does. What has been your experience working with editors and agents and the publishers along this process, particularly if we look just at this one book? It's this book has been insanely amazing. It was picked up by, um, so Dutton is a very small imprint within the enormous Penguin and it's more of a boutique imprint. They only do like 20 books a year or something like that. It's incredibly small. And my, my editor is just divine. She's literally divine. She, I think she weighs 23 pounds. She has (laughs) never worn the same outfit to work twice she rents the runway and comes in and couture every day like she is <laughs> just divine. she's so smart and everybody there was so much behind this book like 
everybody in the whole department from marketing to, to publicity, to graphics, to design, to everything. And that is not a typical experience when you're at a big five publisher. I have often been the person that like, Rachel, what you have a, you have a book. <laughs> um, so this has just been fantastic just for, you know, for whatever reason, this time has been fabulous. Um, and they put real marketing mind and they put real money behind pushing it. Of course that money's done. That money lasts for like three weeks after book comes <laughs> out, but, uh, but it was more than I'd ever had before. Um, but I still love, love, love the experience of, of being indie. I'm solidly very middle hybrid. I, my agent takes out like the mainstream and the, uh, the thriller and some of my memoir, but I publish fast draft your memoir by myself. I do all my romance by myself now because I don't even offer them to her. She doesn't get a chance to say no, because I love indie publishing. I love the, the control mm -hmm. that you have in there. And the fact that I make Last year, I made exactly the same amount of money from Indie and from Trad. It was $21,000 each. I always have, um, in case your listeners are interested, and the very first episode every year of How Do You Write is me breaking down all the money that I made and how I made it. And last year, for the first year, I broke six figures. But only 41000 of that was actually from books. Whoop, whoop. The, the, exactly. The rest of it was just hustle. And so they were back to working 16 hour days, yes. but, but it can be done. That's the thing is it can be done. Um, and I think that both paths are so, so, so equally awesome and mm. equally difficult in different ways. I do love that because I think a lot of the guests I have had on this show at the minute have been solely independent and I'm working on getting a lot more of the traditional side mm -hmm. or straight traditional way. And obviously people like yourself hybrid, um, because I think, there seems to be a very, very big disconnect between whether you're in one camp or in the other. And people seem to be very strong with their opinions. And then there's people like yourself that see both sides of the coin and love both. Yeah, and I, I think love both. There's, there's just too many paths to forego any and just say like, I am solely whatever. Because I think personally for me for a while, I know that I will be indie, but I know that some way down the line when I'm probably a bit more financially stable, I will start looking at the past like that but because it's fun to walk into you know mm. a barnes and noble and see your book on the shelf like no it's 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 i always tell people that it's okay to want it just for that mm. i really wanted to be traditionally published just because i wanted the cachet of being able to walk in a bookstore and see my name and that's a, that's kind of a stupid reason but it's a reason so it's not stupid it was just a feeling i had and it's it's nice it's beautiful. but then to but then to hit publish uh, or uh, re-upload something that wasn't quite right, and, and to be able to do that and uh, jigger your um, your your uh, key, your keywords whenever you want is just as fulfilling. Yeah, I am. Um, I had a little experience last week, so I gave a talk to um, the university I went to. They had an alumni evening, and I was the oh, guest talking great. about it. Yeah, yeah, I was talking about um, sort of my journey, independent publishing, all that kind of good stuff. And uh, you could always tell the people that don't understand how indie publishing works because the guy that introduced me was like, this is Daniel Wilcox. You probably all read his stuff. And I was like, and I, I, I meant it in the nicest way possible. But I think it came out wrong, but I went, I don't think anyone here has read me. <laughs> <laughs> and it turned out I was wrong. There was one person who I found out that my old English lecturer now recommends one of my post-apocalyptic books to her post-apocalyptic class, which is... Oh, that is so cool. You're actually like taught in school. Yes, which is quite... Cool. quite nice to find out because i had no idea but yeah i uh i think <laughs> I, I was trying to work item. yes but i was trying to work out if i've upset anyone in that room by saying that but th th that's the truth like when after i published my first book independently the first thing i was asked by friends was oh where can i buy it in bookstores and you just <sighs> you can tell that people don't understand the process and everything behind oh. it because the books in there are the creme de la creme and they're yeah, and nor and 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 I don't fault them for not under for not understanding it. I did oh, yeah. get a scathing review recently saying that one of my indie books was um, to be chucked in the bin because I was a vanity. This was a vanity published Ugh. piece. Like, there's really a difference between vanity and indie. But all right, mm -hmm. sir, move along. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Keep going on the hate train. <laughs> Next up, <laughs> yeah. I went and looked at the other reviews, and they were. You know, I always like to look at. If I get a really hateful review, I like to click on their link and read all the other hateful reviews they've mm. left for everybody oh, else. Oh, it's really That's interesting. That's the kind of person they are, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, just on random books as well. But that is something that like, I've, I've seen from you, and one of the reasons I wanted to have you on is you seem to be such a positive person, and 
you're you seem to be able to find the good in a lot of the things that, that come up whether it's a challenging situation whether people are being negative like you were just talking about the reviews there like you, you manage to somehow keep a smile on your face have you always been that way or is this something that sort of you've had to work on it's it's uh, it's unfortunate that it is I always I have this strange amount of guilt around it I was born almost too much positivity to the point where I, <laughs> I annoy people and they tell me to knock it off. And then, um, one of my sisters, was, I think I got her optimism. She got all the negative, negative feeling that I should have had. <laughs> so we really see two different worlds and, you know, we love each other. We're best friends, but we see two different worlds. And I, and it's, it's not fair. Like, I don't think it's fair that, that I am, I generally wake up in a good mood and I generally wake up happy. And when I, and when I don't, I mean, I definitely, I've had, you've heard me talk about them. I, I also suffer from depression, but I really like to treat it, <laughs> you know, I, because I like to feel at a baseline, if, if not happy, then just content to be in the space. And that's, you know, I do a lot of meditation and all that California woo woo stuff because it, it works for me. Um, but for me, the glass really is half full and I, and, and some, and I know that a bunch of that is on a chemical level. And so therefore I feel guilty that I, I was gifted it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. But what I'm grateful your, for it. Yeah. What does your meditation routine look like? It is um, mostly, lately it's been in the car, which I know is weird. Uh, but I'm not go, driving. No, no. <laughs> oh, thank God. No. But I, go, I, I would usually do my writing work at the college where I got my master's, Mills College, and that's close to my house. So I drive in and then sometimes I swim and then I go back to my car and I just sit in my car for about 20 minutes and I close my eyes and I've probably looked at anybody passing by like I'm having a quick little nap. But for some reason, being in my car where no one knows where I am um, is really soothing to me. And I just... For me, meditation is thinking about one thing, which is usually where my breath is and how it feels that day, um, and then getting distracted. And the actual meditation practice is in noticing that you're distracted and bringing it back to whatever your focus is. It's not having a calm mind because I can't have a calm mind for more than four seconds, and that's a really long stretch. But uh, but I but enjoy, I enjoy that that feeling of bringing the distract, distraction. Um, right back to where I, I meant it to be on my breath. And it just works exactly the same way in writing, right? Mm. We're writing, 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 we get distracted. Oh, that's okay. Just come back. To the <laughs> so that's why I do it. I really, I really started doing meditation as push-ups for my brain to make me a better writer. And it took on a deeper, more spiritual meaning just by doing it. Mm. So I've done, I, pro- I practiced for probably about seven or eight years now, maybe 10 um, off and on. And I did uh, this, Last year, and I'm doing it again in January, I did a silent retreat, a six-day silent retreat. Yes. Which is outrageous. It's so good. Talk us through it a little bit because I I find that fascinating because, so I've been meditating on and off for about a year and a half, two years now. I'm I'm back in a swing of getting used to it. And actually, I've never thought of it how you've just described in terms of like the writing as well, because that is its own form of meditation. I can't believe I've never linked those two before. Um, But silent retreats have a real appeal to me i don't know what it is i i like plunging myself into situations where i'm completely different from the the home life that you built because i'm aware that what i'm living is just one one viewpoint and there are so many different ones so to go into a world in which you are not allowed to talk must have been a hell of an experience it was so crazy so you get like the first half day you can talk a little bit and then the last half day you can but those four days in the middle there's no talking. There's no eye. They recommend no eye contact because you can do a lot, you know, with hands and eyes and expressions and stuff to be friendly <laughs> with other people. But the the focus there is being with your own mind without distraction. Um, so there's no cell phones. They take them at the door. Uh, there's no books. There's no writing. There's no magazines. When you go back to your room to rest, you lie on your bed and you look at the ceiling. And the meditation actual practices were usually like six or seven sitting meditations um, from 20 to 50 minutes at a time, which, you know, I had never gone past 30. <laughs> so that was, <laughs> that was wild. And then there were a lot of walking meditations between that um, where you would really walk carefully. And it's, it's, it's so funny because you look around and it looks like you're just surrounded by zombies because everyone is walking one foot in front of the next and no one's looking up. And sometimes I just walk my ass right, oh, excuse my language, right down to my, um, my cabin and, and lie on my bed and take a little nap. That was my, <laughs> my that was my sleeping meditation time. 
but it was really transformative to get into this space where there was this ability to have so much less noise. And by the end of it, I didn't want to start talking again. And apparently that's really, really common. Um, it was just a beautiful space where I, no one needed to be supported. Everyone was supporting themselves. And, you know, if you heard somebody crying over there, they would cry. If the, the, one of the weirdest parts is if somebody would sneeze in the meditation hall, <laughs> you could almost hear everybody struggling not to say, bless you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I, it was so wonderful that I signed up again to do it next year. And, Amazing. Uh, I'm definitely going to have to look into it. How, yeah. how much of that has carried forward into your day-to-day life? So much. In mm. fact, that's, that's, I love thinking about that because now I just have a greater toolkit to drop into the now. Mm. Like when I do start to stress out or overreact or get anxious, I have these tools that just allow me to come right back into my body and feel my body. There was where it is in space, what it feels like to be where I am, which is meditation at at its base level, right? To to actually know where you are. And I spent the first 40, you know, 35 years of my life just being a, a, a brain in space. My body carried my brain around, but I didn't know how to relax. Like if my shoulder ached, I didn't, I literally didn't know how to relax it. I did not know that you could control muscles with your mind. I'm not a sports person. <laughs> I, I am a sitting person. And to be able to think about something that needs relaxation and send relaxation there is something that I've learned from meditation, which mm. could not have come any other way. So, so to me, I think with any extended length of meditation, the world does seem to slow down. And if you're trying to sit still and quiet for 10, 15, 20 minutes, the everything does just seem to stretch so, so much. And I think in a world in which everyone is living really, really fast, and I know that particularly now and back when I was in my day job, time just goes really, really quickly to not only sit for 15 minutes, but then to sit for those four days, it must just really sort of unravel what your concept of time is and how that balances. Exactly. But also it brings it out into the real world and you end up living more in the time in which you are in this real kind of interesting way. And I think it was Pima Chodron who said something like, um, we, we live longer lives if we are actually present in the moment, because you can also slow down this moment that you and I are having talking, right? I'm really enjoying this. I'm really here and I'm feeling what we're saying and I'm feeling my body. Therefore, it slowed down for me, and I have a longer life. Even if I die tomorrow, God forbid, mm. I, had a, I had a longer moment that somebody else might have had, living the same amount of days, but always rushing. Yeah. So it's it's cool. It's magic. Time. Time <laughs> is. Yeah. Um, I am aware that, ironically, I'm aware that time is going past quite quickly, <laughs> and uh, so I am going to jump into um, a question from one of our patrons. If you're happy That's to answer great. this. Yes. So um, John Cronshaw asks, have you seen a change in the aspirations of your workshop attendees since the growth of independent publishing? No. Interesting question. <laughs> Done. <laughs> no, uh, I, I haven't. I expected to. And that's why I am so quick to um, answer that. I thought that when Indie got big, I always ask people in my classes, like, do you aim to be traditionally published or are you going to be indie published? And it's still, it's still most people, most people want to try traditional first. Mm-hmm. Um, even with everything awesome that we've heard about indie and how awesome it is, people still, maybe it is, I, I feel like you and I are, live in this kind of rarefied atmosphere where everybody that we listen to knows a lot about publishing. Yes. But the average Joe who comes to class does not. They do mm-hmm. not know how how fabulous indie publishing is. So I kind of like to um, to play with them in that. In fact, I teach one class that is um, traditional versus indie publishing, and that's the entire full. It's a full day's length class, and and usually by the end they all want to indie publish. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it's really interesting. It hasn't changed much. No, I think from again, just I've given a couple of classes at the university in which I went to. Um, just teaching about the I try not to push people towards indie I try to just highlight what indie is um and yeah I think it's just that echo chamber particularly within um higher education or just education in general particularly in the UK I don't know what it is over in America that that seems to be the gateway entry into what publishing is yes and there's there's no reference to independent unless it's sort of a castaway comment until real people start coming in and saying look this is a real path for you guys so exactly exactly 
I'm sure it will change down the line, but it will. It will. Yeah. I have a I have a really prominent, very prominent um, man in my memoir class right now at Stanford who won the American Book Award. Oh wow! He was you know 40 years teaching at Stanford. He's an American, like people, people gasped when he walked in this class and I'm like, why am I teaching him? <laughs> and he came in saying, I think I really want to self-publish a book about my life. And I'm like, yes. yes. When he says that, that is, that is mainstream. He's 72 mm-hmm. years old and ready to do it. Life has changed. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so the final part of this interview is we have our quick fire round. I keep saying we, I need to get part out of this because it was because I used to do the, the story studio <laughs> with Luke and uh, I'm sure listeners have picked up on this a lot, but I keep saying we join we, no, it's me. Take <laughs> ownership, Dan, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I've got the quick fire round, so I'm going to throw 10 questions at you as quickly Fabulous. as possible and uh, just give your best answers and um, we'll see you on the other side. Okay. Cool. Oceans or lakes? Oceans. Ocean. Where's your, where's your favorite reading nook? In my bed. What one thing on your bucket list are you desperate to do? See the northern lights from one of those glass-roofed hotel rooms in Finland. Great answer. (laughs) Would you rather spend a week in the 1930s or a week in 2039? Oh, 1930s. Scared (laughs) of 2039. (laughs) (laughs) Who was the last writer to make you cry? Uh, Oh, gosh. I don't cry from books. Okay. Uh, yeah. What's the most underrated book you've ever read? Underrated book. Oh, these are so hard. As <laughs> soon as I'm asked about books, I go blank. Um, but I'm going to say, uh, 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 I just read it. It's called Help Me. And it's a UK author. And it's about her, it's a memoir about her doing 12 months of reading self-help books, one a month. And it's brilliant. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you have to send me a link to that. I'll drop it in the show notes. Okay. Um, what's your favorite kind of cake? Brownies. How many dogs do you have and what are their names? I have three. Clara is a border collie. Clementine is a uh, pit bull beagle mix, which is cuter than it sounds. And <laughs> uh, Dozy, who is a multi poo who showed up on our front star- doorstep and is just a jerk, but I love her. <laughs> uh, you have to give up one thing in your house worth a hundred dollars. What do you give up? The record player we never use. Hmm? And what's your favorite animal? Cows. Cow? That's 10 questions. <laughs> you got <That's> so fun. <laughs> some of the questions in the middle were a bit harder. I think some of them are some of but the it's quite funny because when you speak to authors, anytime you mention in quick quick questions about a book that they've read. They, go they all go blank. Why do we yeah. go blank like that? It's crazy. Why do we do that? Don't know what it is. I, I'm sure I'd do the same, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And uh, I guess a final additional question is where can listeners find out more about yourself and everything you're working on? Oh, uh, rachelheron.com. It's R-A-C-H-A-E-L, kind of like Michael. And you can find me if you want to follow me even just for one month and see what I do with Patreon. I recommend following people and then and then stealing their best ideas. I'm at patreon.com slash Rachel, R-A-C-H-E-E-L. Perfect. What a treat and delight it has been talking to you. Yes, thank you so much for your time. This has been absolutely brilliant. I've really, really enjoyed it. Hey, thank you, thank you, thank you. I wish you very, very happy writing. Thank you, and to you. And uh, thank you to all of the listeners, and I will see you next week. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Great Writer Share podcast. Next week, I'll be joined by the author of the Eden East series and fellow British podcaster, Sasha Black. And don't forget, you can get early access to every episode of the Great Writer Share podcast and the chance to ask upcoming guests any of your questions just by becoming a patron of the show. All you need to do is visit www.patreon.com forward slash greatwriterssshare and support the show for as little as $1 a month. One more time, that's www.patreon.com forward slash greatwriterssshare. Until next time.